senator. We've misplaced the senator. What? Yes, senator. Yes, I can hear your voice, sir, but I can't see you. No, you're behind the thicket back there, sir. I can't. No, 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 senator. You can't go round, sir. No, no, no. Get over to your right. Keep thrashing to you. I can't. Look, there's a large boulder over here on your right. I'll rendezvous there with you, sir. Keep thrashing that way. I'll be there. All right, Senator, here you are. Got you. All right, Senator. Easy, easy. You're going to be fine. Now get your arm. Get your arm around my neck. There you go, Senator. You're going to be fine. You're going to be just fine. What, Congressman? What bird? That bird there, that's a Deliconix irisivoris icteridae family. Bobbling to you, Congressman. Bobbling to you. <laughs> All right, Senator, you're going to be fine. Now, here. Believe me, Senator, you're going to make it. Now, here. Now, just get your torso up here. There you go. Now, I'm going to push you from the rear. All right, sir. Now, I'm going to grab your knee. There, I've got it. All right, sir. Now, here we go. Up, see, Daisy. There we go. All right, Congressman, you're next. You can do it yourself. Let's see you do it. Bully, bully. Very well done, Congressman. Well, we made it. Opus, Congressman. The last is always the best. Oh, yes, Sagamore Hill is glorious this time of year. Yes, the trees are lovely, I grant you. But as I was telling you in the Senate, Senator, are you sure you're all right? Oh, no, stay down on your hands and knees, Senator. It's all right. No, no, you just keep gasping for air. Yes, you have a perfect right to be exhausted, sir. You've traversed over five miles today. Just stay right there until you've revived. Now, Congressman, as I was telling you and the Senator, these trees here in the east are pygmies. Oh, yes, you've got to get out to Yellowstone Park in California. I tell you, they have trees out there, sir, that are so tall, it takes two men to look to the top of them. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, one looks until he becomes exhausted. And then the other looks the rest of the way. <laughs> but we've got to save them. That's the point of this visit to Sagamore Hill today, sir. Oh, those trees belong to all the people, not just a few selfish men. Oh, yes, I know my legislation is still in the books, but it needs enforcing, and you're not going to get any help from the White House anymore. Now, oh, that's why you boys in the Congress have got to carry the ball and hit the line hard. After all, it's 1912, and the century is slipping away from us. <laughs> all right. Fine, I'm glad we see eye to eye on that, sir. Now, sir, oh, Senator, you're on your feet. Easy, easy does it, Senator. Easy does it. Now, you're going to be fine, sir. You get up to the house, both of you, and Edie and the girls will pat you up as good as new. Now, Elihu will show you the way. Where is Elihu? Elihu, what are you doing sitting in the rowboat? Well, I know you hurt your toe. Come on, Elihu, you have to get up and show these gen... Come, sit down. Ah, here we are. Oh, don't worry about your wet pants. That'll just ease you into your second childhood. Now, step out, Elihu. Step out. There you go. All right, there you're fine, fine. Now, just work it, Elihu. Just work your toe. What? Well, we're not as young as we were when I was in the White House. Four years is a long time, especially at our age. Now, here, you show these gentlemen up to the house, would you, Elihu? Fine. And get into a nice warm tub, gentlemen. You'll feel as good as new. And tell Edie that I'll be along shortly. Well, there they go. <laughs> the remnants of my tennis cabinet. The walking wounded. <laughs> you know, in the seven and a half years that I was in the White House, I tried to get in at least two or three hours every day of strenuous physical exercise, either tennis or horseback riding or one of these obstacle course walks you've just observed. Of course, in those days, the walks took place up Rock Creek Park in Washington. It was then as wild as any stream in the White Mountains. And the press dubbed my companions on those walks the tennis cabinet. Now, it included, of course, my cabinet, my ambassadors, undersecretaries, oversecretaries, and then, of course, we pushed the phrase out to include my old-time Western friends, cowboys, cowpunchers, hunters, prize fighters, writers, and, of course, many of them had engaged in rather more serious outdoor adventures with me than just walking for pleasure. What we do, you see, we would pick a spot about four or five miles distance, and then we would make a beeline for it, and the rule was that anything that got in our way was not to cause us to digress or stop. And if anything was foolish enough to get in our way, well, we would just go over it, under it, or through it, never around it. Oh, no, including the Potomac River. Oh, yes, we'd just strip down and swim across. Of course, in that event, we'd make sure that our return to Washington would be after dark. <laughs> so as not to scandalize the natives. 
But oh, I remember, I remember the first time, oh dear, the, <laughs> the first time that the French ambassador, a man named Jules Jusserand, he was not then known to me, but he has since become one of my dearest and best friends on this earth. But the first time that Jules Jusserand, the French ambassador, was asked to join the tennis cabinet. Now, I had sent word through the embassies for the French ambassador to join us all for a walk. Well, somehow walk got translated into promenade at the French embassy. <laughs> because Monsieur Jusserand, the French ambassador, arrived at the White House very punctually, but in full diplomatic regalia. He had on a top hat, boutonniere, dove gray vest, cutaway coat, pearl-handled walking stick, and lavender kid gloves. <laughs> Well, you know, he looked as though he was about to stroll through the Tuileries or, or on the Champs-Élysées. Now, we were dressed, of course, as I am now. But you can't embarrass another human being because of his clothing, can you? Of course you can. So we just started out. Pell-mell through the city, out into the country, and I set a pretty good pace, always straightforward. And I must say, that Jusserand kept right up. If he was winded, he didn't show it. He was a plucky little devil. I think he had the honor of La Belle France in his heart. Well, anyway, onward, onward into the evening sunset. Strolled the tennis cabinet until suddenly the Potomac River got right smack in our way. By a rather well-planned coincidence, I might add. <laughs> well, I looked over at the French ambassador and I could see the wheels going around. He was saying to himself, ha, ha, ha. At last, at last, we have reached the goal. Now we are certain to rest a moment and then return the way we have came. <laughs> well, I said strip. <laughs> strip, boys, we can't get our clothes wet, can we? We had Luther Kelly. Do you remember Luther Kelly? Better known as Yellowstone Kelly from his days as army scout against the Sioux Indians. Well, Luther, now Luther was a tall pine tree of a man. And he began to strip down. And we had Abernathy the wolf hunter. Well, Abernathy was more of a fire plug of a man. <laughs> he began unbuttoning. Oh, and we had Elihu Root. Elihu Root, who was then my secretary of war, and even poor dear Elihu, was very shortly standing there in all his bony splendor. <laughs> and before you knew it, all of us, including the French ambassador, were standing with our clothes piled on top of our heads, gazing at a rather forbidding Potomac River. We really must have looked like a bunch of antique bottles lined up on a shelf. <laughs> well, I looked over at the French ambassador and I said, Monsieur Jusserand, you still have your gloves on. And he said, Monsieur President, with your permission, I will keep the gloves on. It would be most embarrassing if we should meet the ladies. <laughs> well, we never did meet the ladies, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> oh dear. Oh no, 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 no. Oh no, Quentin would never forgive me. You know, someone once said that this was the first famous toy of the 20th century. Amazing animal bears. Of course, the king of all the bears is the grizzly bear. Scientific name is Essus horribilis, known to old-time trappers and hunters as Old Ephraim, or Moccasin Joe, and the last Marcuson Joe refers, of course, to the huge half-human footprint. When you see it, it really looks as though a misshapen giant had passed that way, wedding moccasins. I was camped near the Britterroot Mountains in Montana one time, and I discovered one morning that a grizzly bear had been feeding on the carcass of a moose that I had killed for food, and I made up my mind to get a shot at it that evening. Like most wild animals who've known the neighborhood of man, the grizzly bear is a creature of the darkness, and so... When the shadows began to lengthen, I shouldered my rifle and I started out. I had to go about a mile and a half before I finally reached the heavily wooded floor of the valley at the upper end of which lay the moose carcass. And I walked very softly on moccasin feet under the great branches. It was already dusk and the air had that cool, dead chill of evening. 
And as I approached the clump where the carcass lay, I walked with redoubled caution, watching and listening. And under the great pines, the evening had the still silence of primeval desolation. The melancholy of the wilderness came over me like a spell. Slightest noise made my pulses throb as I stared motionless into the gathering gloom. And then I heard a twig snap. Suddenly, out of the bushes, stepped the great bear. His huge bulk seemed unreal. He didn't see me. And silent as the night, he started toward the moose carcass. I waited until he was almost there. And I put a bullet between his shoulders, and he fell. And the sound of his savage roar reverberated through the forest. Again he was on his feet. Again I hit him. This time he fell, squalling and yelling. Again he was on his feet. This time at a heavy gallop into a thicket where I lost him. I raced down the hill obliquely to cut him off. Watch out! There he was, standing broadside to me. Scarlet strings of foam hung from his lips. His eyes burned like embers in the gloom, but I held true. And I put a bullet in his thorax. And then the mighty beast charged straight at me, with a harsh roar of fury, blowing the bloody foam from his mouth. As he came charging through the laurel thicket, making it impossible to aim, I waited until he was almost upon me. Then I aimed for his forehead. But my bullet went low, smashing his lower jaw. And then through the hanging smoke, I saw his paw. As I made a vicious sideswipe at me, but the force of his rush carried him past and he fell, leaving a dark red pool of blood while his muzzle hit the earth. Then he made two, three lunges toward me, but suddenly his muscle seemed to give way. His head drooped. He rolled over and was dead. It was bully. <laughs> Just bully. Of course, it isn't always that way. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, dear. In fact, the saga of this little fellow. Well, now, that was a good deal more like low farce than high drama. I'd gone hunting bear, let's see, 1902, shortly after I'd become president. It was in Mississippi. And naturally, we had a large retinue of reporters along. And we had an old hunter, an old guide. Now, he was a marvelous guide and a hunter, but the old gentleman was so worn out with rheumatism and old age that his temper gave way long before his physical endurance. And fortunately, his rheumatism made it necessary for the old gentleman to carry a wooden staff instead of a rifle. And I say fortunately, because if he had carried a rifle, I am convinced he would have shot everything that moved along the way. <laughs> including some endangered species. <laughs> well, anyway, in the middle of the afternoon, suddenly the old man stopped. And rather creakily, he bent over and with a quavering finger, he pointed to the red clay. And then he whispered, Moccasin Joe. Well, naturally, we all froze. And then we heard a noise. And it came closer and closer, and closer, and suddenly, <laughs> out of the bushes toddled a little cub bear. Shoot, you damn fool, shoot, yelled the old hunter. Well, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't. And fortunately, the little thing toddled back into the thicket from whence it came. And I say fortunately, because if it had not, I am convinced that that old man would have clubbed it to death with his wooden staff right then and there. <laughs> but we got a lot of publicity out of that, you see, because of the reporters present. And a cartoonist in Washington, D.C. made a cartoon showing the great white hunter <laughs> refusing to kill the little cub bear. Now, a fellow in Brooklyn, New York, saw the cartoon. He ran a toy store named Mictum. And Mr. Mictum made a little brown plush bear with movable limbs and button eyes, and he called it Teddy's Bear. And he wrote me a letter asking permission to use my name. And I wrote back and said I couldn't imagine why my name would be of any value in the bear business. But <laughs> he certainly was welcome to it. Well, anyway, the idea caught on. My word, didn't it, though? I mean, <laughs> well, heavens, now, now we're all up to our gluteus maximus and teddy bears. <laughs> but you know, it is a charming, really honestly, objectively viewed, it's a charming toy. And, and it seems to me quite harmless. 
And yet, my friends, I must tell you that a priest in Michigan recently stated from the pulpit, I am in, uh, reliably informed that he stated from the pulpit that Teddy was an insidious weapon. <laughs> yes, yes, he said it was being used to thwart the instincts of motherhood. <laughs> and he went further. He said it would eventually cause racial suicide. <laughs> really? Uh, well, Chacon <laughs> à son goût. <laughs> oh, dear, 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 the lunatic fridge. Oh, deliver me from the lunatic fridge. For example, when I was president, the Women's Christian Temperance Union stated publicly that this country's problems, both foreign and domestic, were due to the fact, totally, that from time to time, sherry wine was served in the White House. <laughs> really, honestly, we must keep a sense of proportion, my friends. Look sharp. <laughs> oh, very well done. Marvelous, did you, marvelous catch. Oh, you'll make the team. You'll make the team. Oh, no, I'm so proud of you. That's very nice. A lovely young lady. Oh, my dear, but just remember, just remember, don't flinch, don't foul, and hit the line hard. <laughs> oh, yes. We must keep a sense of proportion, my friends. We must... We, now, for example, play when you play, but never mistake it for work. I mean, I believe in a vigorous body, but more than that, of course, I believe in a vigorous mind. And more than that, I believe in character. You know, my friends, the 20th century looms big before us with the fate of many nations. And our nation calls not for a life of ignoble ease, but a life of strenuous endeavor. You know, if we sit idly by and we seek only swollen, slothful ease, and we shrink from the contest that men and women must win at hazard of their lives and all they hold dear, then the bolder, stronger peoples will pass us by and win for themselves domination of the world. Far better it is to risk mighty things, to win glorious victories, though checkered by defeat, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in that gray twilight that knows not victory or defeat. Oh, my friend, I preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease. I preach the doctrine of the strenuous life. Thank God! Well, we have the hallelujah chorus in the balcony. <laughs> hallelujah, Bishop Teddy, I heard it distinct. What's that? No, it is not necessary to kiss my what? <laughs> my ring. Uh, no, 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 sir, it is not. However, it is necessary to see who my adversary is here. Yeah? Obviously, it's one of my self-styled critics. Yes, sir, that's the essence of democracy, give and take, but I would like to see my adversary. It sounded like a gentleman's voice, or at least a man. Let me see if I can... Oh, he's holding his hand up, very trepidation. Well, I know you, sir. Mr. Mankin is... Of course, Mankin, young Mankin, I remember... Well, of course I remember you, Mr. Mankin. White House Press Corps. Henry... I beg your pardon, of course. No, no, it's H.L. I beg your pardon, Mr. Macon. I had forgotten that you part your name on the side. <laughs> well, Mr. Macon, it's a pleasure. What, sir? Yes, Bishop Teddy, is it? I see. You enjoyed my sermon? Ah, no, sir. That is not what we fertilize the White House lawn with. <laughs> Speaking of that, do you still work for the Baltimore Sun? You do? Ah, no, that's right. You're a critic now, aren't you, for that sophisticated magazine, The Smart Set. Oh, indeed. Oh, yeah. yes, I've read it, Mr. Mankin. Indeed, I have. Now, I rather enjoyed your critiques, sir. They're mildly amusing, but totally ineffective. <laughs> well, why? Because, sir, I've been trying to tell you self-appointed intelligentsia for years that you've got to shoot the way you shout. We need action. Yes, sir, I'm afraid I have been accused of being rather noisy myself from time to time. In fact, do you know the doggerel, our hero is a man of peace, preparedness he implores, his sword within its scabbard sleeps, but mercy, how it snores. <laughs> well, of course, as we all know, it wasn't a sword, it was a big stick, and I always walk softly. <laughs> no, the Panama Canal, Mr. Mankin, I tiptoed through the Panama... Yes, sir, I pushed the canal through the isthmus, I did it, and through the Congress. No, I didn't tell my cabinet there wasn't time. 
Oh, there was indeed a debate in the Congress, Mr. Macon, but while the debate went on, so did the canal. <laughs> you see, sir, something you could never understand, you youngsters in the press. I believe in power. Oh, indeed I do, and I believe in the power of a strong chief executive. As long as that power is returned to the people after a reasonable and definite period of time and hopefully returned untarnished. You know, you youngsters in the press, I really have to take issue. I'm glad you're here tonight, Mr. Macon. You always presented me as the proverbial Irishman at Donny Brook Fair. Rather fight than eat. What? Yes, there's some Irish in me, of course, along with the Dutch and the English and the German and Italian and French and on an election day, who knows what? <laughs> no, Mr. Macon, I'm like Mark Twain. I'm an American mongrel and glad of it. Young man, admit it. You could never figure me out, really. No, no, you couldn't. You could never figure whether I was a conservative radical or a radical conservative. Admit it. <laughs> or a radical conservative, populist, progressive, monarchical imperialist. <laughs> you opt for the last. No, sir. No, no, please. I know. Perish the thought, Mr. Macon. No, no, no monarchist I, sir. The more I see of the Kaiser and the Mikado. Oh, and the Kaido, no, 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 no. The more content I am with American democracy, even if we do have to accept as one of its assets the American newspaper. <laughs> That's a joke, Mr. Macon, joke. <laughs> For heaven's sakes, I like the, I put the first press room in the White House, as you well remember. And you, well, for heaven's sakes, if you, I like newspaper men, and if you treat them fairly, they'll treat you fairly. And you know, it's not true, my friends, that a newspaper man will not keep a secret, absolutely not. All you have to do is impress upon him that whoever he tells the secret to must keep it a secret. <laughs> and then, of course, you have to be very careful in selecting the secret that you don't want them to tell. <laughs> What? No, Mr. Maker, please, not the canal again. No, sir, there were no secrecy involved, but... No, I could not negotiate with the Colombian government, Mr. Maker. That was like trying to nail currant jelly to the wall. It can't be done. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mr. Maker, I weary of this entire colloquy, sir. Could we draw it to a close, please? No, I tell you, I'll give you a scoop, sir. How's that? All right, a scoop, direct quote, and that should be quit. All right. Do you have a pencil and a piece of paper? Of course you do. Tools of your trade. All right. Here's a direct quote. Are you ready? All right, I, Theodore Roosevelt, I'll wait for you. <laughs> I, Theodore Roosevelt, took Panama. I, Theodore Roosevelt, took Panama. What, Edie? What, darling? Oh, 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 tea time. Oh, thank you, Edie, darling, thank you. No, 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 I want my tea, Edie, I want my tea. Mr. Macon, you'll have to excuse me. I have to have my tea now. Thank God for tea. <laughs> thank you, dear. Thank you very much. Oh, Edie, you brought the mail. Very good. Here's one from... Oh, my word, here's one from Basil Gritto, my dear. What? No, dear, no, no, one of the Rough Riders. No, 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 not one of the college chaps, cowpuncher, fondly known as Snakebite. In fact, he's out west again, my dear. Let's see what Snakebite has to dare. Colonel, I am in trouble. I shot a lady in the eye, oh my word. But I didn't intend to hit the lady. Good for you, Gritto. I was shooting at my wife. <laughs> What, dear? No, 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 Edith. He was just remarking on his extraordinary marksmanship, that's all. <laughs> well, well, you're going into Oyster Bay. Oh, Edie, wait a minute, darling. Would you post a letter for me, please, dear? Yes, I was just finishing it up to Kermit. And you can take it and post it for me. I was just telling Kermit about Quentin's getting his legs so badly sunburned last Tuesday, you remember? And the little boy looked down at the legs and said they looked like a Turner sunset. Don't they, Daddy? Do you remember? And then he said, I shan't be caught this way in public, Daddy. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> you know, darling, I can understand the little scamp. For a 12-year-old, it's understandable, quoting Poe, but where do you suppose he ever got any knowledge of Turner Sunset? I know, I know, he is the cunningest, darlingest little child. I... Yes, dear, that is the front door. Yes, go ahead and answer it. And I'll finish this up, Edie, and then you can post it for me. <laughs> you know, Kermit, I am having the best time of any man my age in all the world. I thought I'd enjoyed myself in the White House, and I did. 
but I am enjoying myself more thoroughly out of the White House. And what's more, I fully intend to get what dear? Who? Gifford Pinchot, William Allen White, and Ella Hugh Root here now? Well, Evie Dolly, show them in, my dear, show them in. Delighted gentlemen, oh my word, what a lovely, uh, Ella Hugh, how are you, Ella Hugh, my, what the children are fine. Thank you, Ella Hugh, so good to see you, and Bill, how are you, Bill, good to see you. Yes, the trees are lovely, aren't they? Absolutely, and Gifford, hello, Gifford, how are you, what? What horse? Oh, the gray, the dapple gray. You mean on the, uh, yes, the left-hand side of the drive, driving up absolutely new. Very observant of you, Pincho. Very observant of you. Well, it's so good to see you, Gifford. And Bill, and Ellie, you, my word, gentlemen, what a glorious surprise. Well. Well, now, gentlemen, I'm sure you didn't travel all the way to Sagamore Hill to discuss my children and my horses. All right, Pincho. I like that. I like that very much. That's cutting through, cutting what the question is. What do I think of our president, Mr. Taft? Well, as you gentlemen know, he's a good friend of mine. And of course, I handpicked him to succeed me in the presidency in 1908. I personally put him on the hot seat that he now occupies. However, my enemies at that time said it was because I had a weakness for 300 pound bears. <laughs> But it's not true, gentlemen. Oh, no, 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 no. I firmly believed that Bill Taft would make one of the finest presidents this country has ever known. Now, Bill, well, now, wait, wait a minute, Bill, just a minute. He was a wonderful judge, you know. Oh, yes, and he administered the Philippines magnificently for me. And he was one of my top lieutenants when I was president. Now, well, now, wait a minute. Oh. Well, all right, Bill, all right, all right. Now, after four years of Mr. Taft in the White House, I... I would have to rather reluctantly and sadly conclude that he was a follower, not a leader. Me, Bill White, don't you dare say that. No, sir, not me. Oh, Bill, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, I want to close up like a native oyster, Bill. Besides, I told the people in 1904 that under no circumstances would I ever run for the presidency again, and that is still my position. Think about it, Elihu. What? Well, yes, of course. Of course, I'll think about it, Elio. There's no harm in thinking about anything, is there? Well, now, gentlemen, before we have dinner, suppose we have a nice romp through the woods. Oh, you can't stay, Elihu. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> oh, that's a pity. No, I understand. Goodbye, Gifford. Yes, I'll think about it, Gifford. Indeed, I will. Goodbye, Bill. I'll think about it, Bill. I'll think about it. Yes, and come back any time. Of course, you're always welcome here. Goodbye, Elihu. How's your toe? Oh, good, good. I knew it would mend. All right. Goodbye, goodbye, gentlemen. Thank you for coming. What, Gifford? Yes, just a moment. Excuse me, dear. I can't hear you, Gifford. I can't. <laughs> oh, that's outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. Get out of here, Pincho. Get out of here. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> oh, don't look at me that way, Edie. Edie, 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 don't look at me that way. No, no, darling, let, let, suppose we take a row on the bay. Well, that'll do us both good. All right, my dear, come, come, come. Come on, Edie, please, please. All right, my dear. Oh, Edie, look at the spruces out by the tennis court. They're sprouting up just like the children, aren't they lovely? And darling, you know, your idea of putting Clematis in here with the roses, come spring, this is gonna be a splash of color here. All right, my darling, up you come. All right, dear, in you go, darling. There you are, when... I was a tadpole and you were a fish in the Paleozoic time. <laughs> what, dear? No, no, it's all right. I was just thinking of something that Pincho whispered to me just before he left. <laughs> no, dear, I can't tell you. It's indelicate. No, darling, I can't. <laughs> What well, all I need is, well, it isn't that bad anyway. No, he said that after T.R. came Taft, and it was very much as though a sharp sword had been succeeded by a wet roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Legal size. <laughs> oh, Edie, Edie, for heaven's sake. Yes, I know Taft is a friend of mine. Of course I know that. I know that, darling, and I know, Edith, I'm not thinking of running for president, for heaven's sakes, I want to leave our children an honorable name. 
They have that now, and if I were ever elected, oh, such impossibilities would be demanded of me. No, dear, you're absolutely right. But Taft is a flubdub, Edie. Oh, he is a flubdub. And he has a strong streak of the second rate in him. No, darling, you're absolutely... I'm not going to run for president, for heaven's sakes. No, 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 not possibly. No, darling, but I tell you, I really would like to sink my spurs into Taft's rather voluminous flanks and ride him off the range. <laughs> oh, no, Edie. No, der Verdienst ist Freiheit wie das Leben, der täglich sich erroben muss. Goethe was right. He only earns his freedom and existence who daily conquers it anew. <laughs> no, dear, I'm not going up to the house. You go ahead. I'll, I'll follow. All right, my dear. Out you go. Easy does it. All right, Edie. No, no, I'm going to stay down here, dear. Chop some wood and see which way my zeitgeist is pointing. <laughs> no, dear, I shan't chop down all the trees. <laughs> You know, the man who got the most joy out of living of any man I've ever known was my father, Theodore Roosevelt. And he performed his duty more wholeheartedly than any man I've ever known. And you know, that's an extraordinary combination. Performance of duty and joy in living. Father took the children's education so seriously. I remember when I was just 11 years old, he took the entire family to Europe for the first time. And he left all four children with a German family in Dresden called Minkwitz to learn the culture and the language. And it was in Dr. Minkwitz's library that I first discovered the Nibelungenlied. You know, the great Norse saga. Now, I was a very, very sickly and frail child. So it's only natural, I suppose, that the great heroes in the sagas appealed to me mightily. Siegfried. <laughs> Siegfried slew the dragon at the foot of the mountain and then bathed in its blood. And it coated his body so that he has never been wounded in battle since. But then a broad leaf fell from the linden tree and settled gently between his shoulder blades. It was there that Siegfried could be wounded. I shall take some fine silk, said Kriemhild, and I shall sew a cross on his back where none will notice and you, Hagenotronic, must shield him when the battle is fiercest. But when the noble knight bent over the brook to drink of the cool, sweet water, Hagen of Tronic hurled a spear at the cross of silk and the hero's <coughs> blood leapt from the wound. Siegfried, had been wounded to death. Soon, many fair maidens would be weeping for him. Papa, Papa, I can't breathe, sir. I can't hear air. Papa, lie still, I can't. I can't lie still, sir. I can't breathe. I'll try, sir. I'll try. That is better, Papa. Papa, will I always be this way? Will I always have asthma? It's up to me, but Papa, the doctors... Yes, sir, I know. God gave me a strong mind, but I must make my own body. I'll try, Papa. Pap. No, Papa, I will. I will. I'll make my body. I will. I was a, a very, very shy and reclusive child. And whenever I was thrown together with other little boys my own age, I simply could not cope. And yet, from reading about the men I admired, the soldiers at Valley Forge and Morgan's Riflemen, and the heroes of my other favorite stories, but most of all, from knowing my father, I had a great admiration for men who were fearless and could make their way in the world, and I had a fierce determination to be like them. <laughs> my, my first boxing instructor 
was a man named John Long. Now, I shall never forget Mr. Long. I, he was an ex-prize fighter. I shall never forget his rooms, the smell of them, and the look of them. He had pictures hanging about of great fighters, Tom Heyer, Yankee Sullivan. And once a year, Mr. Long held what he called championship matches <laughs> for his little charges. And I entered, never thinking I could win because every time I got frightened, my asthma always got the better of me. But this time, <laughs> I won. <laughs> and my prize was a 50 cent pewter mug. It's been one of my most valued possessions ever since. When I was 12 years old, I was permitted to take taxidermy lessons from a Mr. Bell. Now, Mr. Bell was a tall man. He was straight as an Indian. He'd been a companion of Audubon's. And Mr. Bell, well, he taught me not only taxidermy. Mr. Bell taught me the wondrous interrelationship of all things natural on this earth. And it was in that same summer that I got my first gun. It was a pinfire breech loader, double barrel of French manufacture. And the thing that puzzled me was that my little companions seemed to see things to shoot that I could not see at all. And I told Papa about it, and very shortly, I got my first set of spectacles. Now, up to that point, I'm afraid I had been a rather clumsy, awkward child. And I'm sure it was due to my general characteristics, but part of it, at any rate, had to have been due to the fact that I simply could not see, and yet was totally ignorant of the fact that I could not see. But now, now with my new spectacles, well, the world was waiting for me. Now the world would truly be my oyster. Bay. <laughs> Papa, yes, Papa, I'm coming, sir. No, 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 old sir, all I have to do is change my clothing, and I'll be right with you, sir. I just had to put, oh, oh, Papa, what's that? Oh, no, Papa, I adore Harvard, sir. Oh, indeed I do. No, sir, no, Papa, on the contrary, sir. No, no, I think it's an advantage that I had to be tutored all these years at home because I was so ill. No, Papa, it makes me appreciate the camaraderie of the other men that much more. And, Papa, I adore the competition. Papa, I'm going out for the boxing teams, and I'm going to... What's that? Oh, yes, Papa, I've thought about it. Oh, indeed, sir, I've thought about little Elsa. And, Papa, I've finally made up my mind. Yes, sir, I'm going to be a scientist. Yes, sir! Oh, thank you, Papa, thank you, thank you. Yes, I know you've made it economically feasible for me to pursue pure research, and I'm most grateful. What, sir? In matter of my finances, I should always keep the fraction constant. All right, sir, I sh shall. I, I don't know what that means, sir, but I certainly shall. <laughs> But if I'm not going to increase the numerator, then I must not increase the denominator. All right, sir, I shall. I still don't know what that... <laughs> Wait a minute, Papa. Yes, I do. You mean if I'm not going to earn money, then I must compensate for that by not spending any. Yes, sir, I do understand. And, Papa, may I tell you, sir, that whatever I undertake, I'm going to make you proud of me, sir, that I promise you that was the last serious talk I ever had with my father. He died at age 46 when I was a sophomore at Harvard. He was the finest man I ever knew. He was not only my father. He was the best friend that I ever had on this earth. Well, after that talk with him, at any rate, I, I was firmly decided that I was going to be a scientist. No, Mama, no, darling. I know, dear, I know, Mama, what I said, sweetheart, but I, I changed my mind. That's right, I no longer want to be a scientist, Mama. No, 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 I don't. No, dear, well, it's Harvard's fault, Mama. Oh, yes, they say that anything that isn't done in a laboratory over a microscope is not science, and the natural science I love is outdoors. No, it's a good school, Mama. Oh, no, no, Harvard is a good school, my dear. No, Mama, it's just that, well, there's a rather thin patina of sophistication overall. I mean, Mama, on, on campus, I run wherever I go but my classmates seem to stroll. <laughs> the law, Mama, not the law, darling. No, no, no. The more I read of the law and the more I hear of it in the classroom, the more I'm convinced that the law is against justice.
business? Business? No, 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 darling, not business. Well, well, Mama, for example, you know the dicta, uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware? Well, it seems to me that, that the seller must have some obligation, too. I know, dear, and writing. No, Mom. Well, no, no, darling, I adore writing, but not as a life's work. Oh, no, no, I'm going to finish my history of the War of 1812, Mom. Oh, of course I'm... And, but, Mama, don't wait for that with bated breath, dear. Really, as, <laughs> as, as popular reading, it's about as rollicking as a Latin dictionary. So, <laughs> yes, dear, I, I know there's no rush, Mama, I know, but a man does have to get on with it, doesn't he? Yes, dear, I do know what Papa would say. Duty and service, service and duty. I do indeed. Well, thank you, darling. I wish I shared your optimism, my dear, but, but I do thank you for your support. Thank you, Mama. Well, I didn't want to be a scientist. And I didn't want to be a lawyer, and I didn't want to be a businessman. And I didn't want to be a writer. <laughs> and then, of course, to the surprise of my family, and my friends, but most of all, to myself. I decided to go into politics on the sidewalks of New York. You know, in the 1880s, a young man of my conviction and upbringing could only join one political party, the Republican Party. But that wasn't as easy as it may sound, because before you joined it, you first had to find it. <laughs> and when I announced my intentions to my wealthy friends, the self-appointed oat mom, they took me discreetly aside and they said, Theodore, Theodore, political clubs are an obscene thing and will surely drag you down. They're run by streetcar conductors, saloon keepers, and sellers of pork. <laughs> and they'll make you a social pariah on the sidewalks of New York. And I said, very well. That simply means that you folks are not members of the governing class. And I intend to be a member of the governing class. Well, it was just about that time that I made, by chance, friends with one of the governing class, a chap named Joe Murray. Now, Mr. Murray became my political mentor, and he was an eloquent teacher. He said, Theodore, you got to get it through them four eyes of yours. <laughs> that politics is a rough game, Theodore. He said, Tammany Hall runs the whole show. And this city and this state is democratic up to its navel. <laughs> he said, all me and me gang do, Theodore, is the usual political gang work for the leader. And then the leader gives us our just rewards. Well, after one election, the leader failed to give Joe his just rewards, thinking, I suppose, that Joe would forgive and forget, but Joe Murray, was not a man to forgive or to forget because when the next election rolled around, to the absolute horror, shock, surprise of the Republican hierarchy, Joe Murray proposed me, a 22-year-old unknown, as candidate for the New York State Assembly. And then Joe set about seeing to it with his gang that I got my just rewards. He came to me the day after my successful election, and he had a grin from ear to ear. He said, oh, Theodore, you should have been there with us yesterday. He said, you should have been in the ballot boots with us. <laughs> he said, you know them guys that come to vote three, four, five times Democratic? Well, we trun them out on their heads, Theodore. And then we picked up their ballots and we slipped them to our boys to vote. <laughs> well, the result was that in a district that theretofore had been solidly Democratic, a 22-year-old unknown Republican boy went to the New York State Assembly by the name of Theodore Roosevelt. Now, at that time, well, I had neither the inclination, nor the ability, nor the reputation to have tried it on my own. Well, I wouldn't even have thought of it. But it didn't matter anyway, because it wasn't my fight. 
It was Joe Morris. And I won. <laughs> East, side, west, side, all around the town. We jumped over the railroad tracks and the walls came tumbling down. Joe and me together, my political stalk. He gave birth to my whole career on the sidewalks of New York. <laughs> I enjoyed that immensely. I know what you're thinking. A rather dubious beginning for a young reformer. Yes, well, make no mistake about it, I did fancy myself a young reformer. Oh, I burned with a zeal that is only given to the uninitiate. I was fairly a tremble to get to Albany and set the world right. Of course, it was a world about which, for all practical purposes, I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> However, it was this period in my life that I went west for the first time. And I discovered the Dakota Badlands and a little town called Medora on the little Missouri River. And I purchased a ranch there. And before I returned to my duties in the New York State Assembly, I got my first taste of, of Western living. And I adored it. I don't think I shall ever be able to adequately describe the effect of the Great West on the sensibilities of a young Eastern boy like myself. I, I only remember specifics. I remember, for example, the effect of a scorching sun on the plains. It took the air and made it waver and shimmer in the heat. And it looked to me like eternity. And then, of course, the freezing misery of riding night guard around the cattle, the stars. Oh, oh, oh. The stars were a glory in my eyes every night before I went to sleep and the blizzards. Oh, the blizzards that blew the snow dust so hard against my face that it literally burned my flesh. But I felt the beat of hearty life in my veins, the glory of work and the joy of living, and I returned to the East, filled to the brim, to my duties in the New York State Assembly and to my young bride. Her name was Alice Hathaway Lee. And I saw her first on October 18th, 1878. And I loved her the minute I saw her. Sweet, fair, young face. And we were betrothed on January 25th, 1880 and married on October 27th of the same year. And we had three years of happiness that seldom come to man and woman. And then on February 12, 1884, our little girl was born. She called it Alice as we planned. She kissed it. My wife seemed perfectly well. But a few hours later, not knowing she was in the slightest danger, but thinking only that she was falling into a deep sleep, she became insensible and died. At 2 o'clock, February 14, 1884, at number 6 West 57th Street, New York City, New York. Pure and joyous as a maiden, tender and loving as a young wife, when her life seemed to be but just begun and the years seemed so bright before her, when she had just become a mother, by a strange and terrible fate, death came to her. And when my heart's dearest died, the light went from my life forever. And on that same day, in that same house, my beloved mother died. And we buried them both together. And I, I ran away. I ran west. Oh, Edie, Edie, darling, no. Edie, dear, no, darling, no. <laughs> Edie, I'm sorry, sweetheart. No, 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 no. I wasn't firing at Mr. Taft, Edie. No. No, I hadn't decided to go for the nomination, my dear. What? 
Quentin said, what, I promised not to go hunting without him? <laughs> oh, no, Edie. No, no, dear. I was just recollecting and remembering the Old West and Alice and thinking, my dear, how the Old West made me healthy enough to come back and fall in love with you, my dear, and I'm most grateful to you. What, Edie? Yes, I know. The men are here due at 6 o'clock for my answer on the... It's 6 now? Oh, Edie, it can't be. My word. Oh, dear, I wanted to discuss this with you, Edith. Edie, if I am at the crest of the wave now and I start to go down, would it make any real difference to you? You've heard me speak this way before. When, my dear? Well, Edie, when I was vice president, I had ample good reason. Well, Edie, for, for heaven's sakes, remember what Mr. Dooley said about the vice presidency. It's not a crime, exactly. <laughs> you can't get sent to prison for it. It's more like a disgrace. <laughs> but, Edie, I was 42 years of age, my dear, and I... Well, I was just starting to get some reforms put through as governor of the state of New York, my dear. And the corporations and the political power brokers wanted me out of there. Oh, yes, and they had their way with me, didn't they, though? They rolled right over me. They put me out to pasture as vice president of the United States. I really felt as though I were taking the veil. <laughs> On September 6, 1901, an anarchist shot and killed President William McKinley in the city of Buffalo, New York. President Roosevelt? Yes, Senator Lodge, how are you, Cabot? Good to hear you. What? No, sir, I had not read it this morning. Yes, would you read it to me, please? Go. Well, wait, 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 Cabot, back up. What was that first sentence? President Roosevelt's craven posture before the Mexican government. I see. Sir Cabot, are you sure the senator wrote that? You are. Well, here's what I'd like you to do, if you would, Lodge. Go over to his office immediately and take a baseball bat with you. Yes, then I want you to strike him sharply between the eyes. No, that's to get his attention. Then I want you to tell the senator that he is expected here tomorrow at 12.30 sharp for luncheon at the White House. No, he's not going to be the main course. No, <laughs> no, 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 Cabot, no. A Bat Masterson is going to be here. And I, I just, what, what, what is it, son? Well, just a moment, Cabot. There's a small person here. Hold the line. What is it, son? Quentin. Quentin. No, I haven't seen Quentin this morning. Wait a minute, son. Quentin got two new raccoons yesterday. Yes, he did. But I told him that he must build cages for them, and he's probably out by the gardener's shack or down by the stables. All right, son. I'll tell him you were here. What's your name? I'm sorry. Would you spell that for me, please? B-I-N-K. Bink. That's your name. No, it's a lovely name. Lovely name, son. No, no, no. I'll tell him you were here, Bink. All right, fine, darling. Very good indeed. Oh, Bink, would you take this airplane to Quentin? Bat Masterson is going to be here for luncheon tomorrow, Cabot, and I want that warlike senator to meet him. Well, we both know how gentle and kind Bat Masterson is, and I want that warlike senator to realize that bluster and strength are not the same thing at all. No, 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 no. I'll be very gentle with him, Cabot. I'll simply explain that our problems with Mexico are not susceptible to the solutions of force. Oh, in fact, I placed the entire matter before the International Peace Tribunal at The Hague. Did you know that one? That's... Oh, Quentin. Oh, darling, you have the raccoons on Quentin. They're glorious. I would. Let me see them. Let me see them, Quentin. Oh, they're darling, Quentin. Aren't they wonderful? This one is absolutely glorious, isn't it? And this one... Ah, oh, dear! Oh, that's all right. No, no, Quentin. That's perfectly all right. No, no, that was just a love nip, I think. What? Yes, there was a boy to see you, Quentin. That's right, Bink. And I told him you'd be out by the gardener's shack or down by the stables. All right, darling. Oh, Quentin, you're supposed to be building cages. Y yes, yes, four o'clock pillows. Four o'clock pillows, I won't let you down. All right, Quentin. Oh, Quentin, would you take your out? Hello, Lodge. What? I'm sucking my finger. Well, it was just bitten by a raccoon. Must be a Democrat. 
Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute, Cabot. Please don't get started on the fam. Alice, now, listen, uh, Cabot. Alice is a 19-year-old 19, a 19 girl, and she's filled with life. No, I don't want to hear what happened at the Vanderbilt's party in New York City. She did what? She fired a toy cap pistol at Lady Vanderbilt? No, 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 I, I don't find that amusing, Cabot, no. No, no, I find it hilarious. Ah! Oh, no, what? Of course Alice carries a snake in her purse. Yes, I know the snake personally. Yes, it's Emily Spinach. <laughs> Emily Spinach, that's the name of the snake, Cabot. Well, spinach is for its color, and Emily is for an aunt of ours who's thin beyond belief. <laughs> now, look here, Cabot, wait a minute, Lodge. I can either be president of the United States, or I can control Alice. I can't possibly do both. <laughs> Oh, just a moment. Uh, Bill Loeb just walked in. What is it? Oh, oh, dear, dear, dear. The Japanese delegation is here, Lodge. Well, I'm going to try and intercede between they and the Russians, but I don't know what to say to them. Oh, with the Orientals, it's not so much what is how. I see. Well, my what's pretty good, but my how gets me in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> yes, show them in, Bill. Show oh, say, Lodge, you met them, didn't you? Well, help me, Senator, help me. They're inscrutable. Well, that's a big help, Lodge. Thank you very much. I'll just have to figure out some way to unscrew them, won't I? <laughs> oh, here they are, Lodge. Goodbye. Gentlemen, so good. Well, Baron Kamura, how are... Baron, such a pleasure to see you, sir. Yes, Baron, sir. Absolutely welcome. And Minister Takahira, so good to see you too, sir. Indeed... What? This is a toy. No, no, well, it's more, wait a minute, it's more than a toy, gentlemen. This is a reasonable facsimile of a heavier-than-aircraft. That's right, and two of our men flew it two years ago down in the south of this country, and they had it airborne for 59 seconds, gentlemen. Imagine that. I'd like to tell you something. One day, this is going to be a very powerful weapon in war. Well, I've never... How are your accommodations? Oh, good, good, I'm glad. No, yes, this is my office. This is where I work. What? You know the family lives upstairs. We all live right here in the White House. Gentlemen, may I show you around the White House? Well, I'd enjoy that immensely. Yes, we're very fond of the color ourselves. Uh, after you, gentlemen. Gentlemen, oh, no, I'm... Gentlemen, after you. Gentlemen, please. It doesn't matter. I'll go first. <laughs> Well, no, it's much too small for us, gentlemen. You see, we have the six children. And then we have the dogs and the cats and the rats and the snakes and the horses. What? Oh, no, we keep the horses outside. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you too, sir. We like to have the public visitors here. Would you excuse me? I just want to say hello to this gentleman. Nice to see you, sir. How are you? Please, make yourself at home. Have a good time. What's the matter, madam? Are you all right? What? No <laughs> Oh, that's charming. Absolutely charming, madam. Yeah, what is your name? Mrs. Curtis. And may I present Baron Kamura and Minister Takahira of the Japanese Empire. Gentlemen, this is Mrs. Curtis of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She just told me a charming thing. May I, Mrs. Curtis? Oh, thank you. She just said she'd come all the way from Florida to see a real live president. May I tell you, Mrs. Curtis, very often we northerners go down to Florida to see a real live alligator. Yes. The children are fine. Thank you, Mrs. Gettys. Thank you. Well, Alice is blooming, and uh, Kermit and Ted are away at school, and Archie and Ethel are here in the White House, as is Quentin. Quentin? Oh, my word. I'm sorry. Gentlemen, it's... Oh, after... Heaven's alive after four. I must go. I really have an appointment I must keep. Now, we're to meet each other at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning at the State Department. Exactly. All... Mrs. Curtis, would you do me a vast favor? Would you show these gentlemen around the White House? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Yes, gentlemen. Sayonara, 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 sayonara. Dear Ted, I've been having some glorious pillow fights lately here in the White House with Archie and Quentin and their cunning little friends. And we have a glorious game of hide-and-seek planned this Saturday afternoon on the White House grounds. Undoubtedly, it will spill over into the White House proper. My son... At present, I am trying to function as peacemaker between the Japanese and the Russians, trying to bring this terrible war to a close. I enjoy being president. I enjoy the work and having my hand on the lever. And I think I will enjoy myself even more thoroughly this evening, Ted, because I am to give the main address at the annual Gridiron Club dinner here in Washington, D.C., 
And I say enjoy myself thoroughly because I am told that Mr. J. P. Morgan will be there. I can hardly wait. Gentlemen of the Gridiron Club, distinguished guests, there you have it. In pricey form, an outline of my programs for the next four years. And I want to thank you all for your rapt attention during a rather prolonged discourse here. <laughs> However, I know I'm terribly sorry I shouldn't do this, but I, I, it has been rapt attention, gentlemen. But in the area of Mr. Morgan's table over there, it has been wrapped in rather apparent disapproval. Oh, oh, Mr. Morgan, now I'm sure that that pained expression on your face during my speech did not derive from the excellent chicken we were served here this evening. You know, I'd like to, if I might, gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry to keep us all here. I know we're about to be asphyxiated by the cigar smoke and embalmed by the brandy, but I would like to, if I might, just say a few words to Mr. Morgan. You know, Mr. Morgan, recently, it was stated in the press that one of your colleagues, Mr. George F. Bear, Yes, president of the Reading Railway, one of the, the industrial titans in this country. Mr. Bear stated something that has intrigued me. And that is, he said that the laboring man in America need not look to the labor unions for his protection. But rather, said Mr. Bear, the laboring man should look to those Christian gentlemen to whom God in his infinite wisdom had given control of the property rights in this country. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, Mr. Morgan, wait a minute, excuse me. No, I, I know not, sir, of any covenant that you or Mr. Harriman or Mr. Bear or Mr. Gould may have with the Almighty, but Mr. Morgan, I do know that I have a covenant, sir, and it is with the people of this country, and very simply put, it's to see to it that every man, woman, and child, Christian and non-Christian, shares fully in the bounty of this land, Mr. Morgan. If we are not successful in curbing your power, sir, then those that come after us will rise in their wrath and destroy not only you, sir, but this country as well. Oh, Edie, what, what, no, 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 darling, it's perfect, no, no, Edie, it's perfectly all right, my dear. I, I was just remembering, just, uh, just recollecting. Oh, well, the men are here for my answer on the nomination. Oh, Edie, Edie, I wanted to discuss it with you. For yes, gentlemen, come in, Bill, nice to see you, come. Come in, Bill. All right. Nice to see How are you, Bill? Good to see you. Come in. Come in. Hello. Good to see you, Gifford. Right. Please, please, please. Gentlemen, where? Where is Ellie Root? He's decided to stay with Mr. Taft. Well, gentlemen, perhaps we should all stay with Mr. Taft. Yes, Bill, I've thought about it. I have indeed thought about it. And the temptation is great. But the danger is great. Now, oh, the White House, <laughs> the White House is a bully pulpit, and I do rather enjoy being weekday preacher, but... Gentlemen, my hat is in the ring. Let's go for the nomination. All right, Bill. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, Edie, I know, darling, Edith, I know very well that I said a limitation of two terms in the White House was a good principle, but my dear, in the words of Mr. H. L. Mencken, there are times in a man's life when he must rise above principle. Oh, glorious to be back among you again. Oh, back among my people here in the great city of New York. Oh, my friends. This great city that was a city of my forefathers, my birth, and my beginnings. What better place, my friends, to start this great campaign, this great battle, to regain our national self-respect, this great battle to regain the vision of this nation and what it could be that was bequeathed us by our founding fathers. My friends, a vision of a nation whose people walked unafraid between the twin terrors of tyranny and anarchy, a vision of a nation that would not be tyrannized either by labor unions or corporate monopoly, a vision of a nation, my friends, whose chief executive is president of all the people, with favor to none, a vision of a nation that places human rights above property rights, a vision of a nation 
whose people determine their own fate. You know, my friends, in the seven and a half years that I was in the White House, we began to get a grasp on the reality of that vision. And so we created the Bureau of Corporate Control, the Interstate Commerce Commission, we passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Employer's Liability Act, and we bequeathed them all to Mr. Taft. But my friends, unenforced laws are a greater evil than no laws at all. And under Mr. Taft, those laws and those institutions have become toothless tigers. And once again, the will of Wall Street has replaced the will of the people. And I say, enough, 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 and again, enough. We here in America, my friends, hold in our hands the hopes of all mankind, and shame and disgrace will be ours if we trail in the dust the golden hopes of men. Our cause is clear. Our course is true. We shall prevail. Bingo, bingo, give me a hand, bingo. Watch out, watch out. Keep your horse off the tracks there, lad. Hello, Chip. How are you, Buck? And Durango, how are you? Oh, gentlemen, it's great to look into your ugly mugs once again. Hello, Seth Bullock. How are you, Seth? Oh, my word, all of Madonna must be here. Who's minding the saloons? What, Seth? Yes, Hell Rod and Bill Jones, of course I remember him. What about? He got so nervous waiting for me that he drank himself under the table. <laughs> well, when he revives, Seth, you give the old crow bait my love. Boys, watch your horses. Keep them away from the train. This train gets very skittish around horses. What, Seth? No, I can't dismount. I can't dismount. No, I only have a moment. No, I have to ride this iron horse all the way into California by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, what? Yes, we can chat for a... Yes, Seth, I am indeed back in the center of the arena. Center stage, where I belong. Yes, Seth, I do remember what Kermit told you the last time we were out here. Maybe you boys didn't hear it. My son Kermit, the last time we were here, told Seth Bullock that his father always liked to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> and he was right, you old waddy. But boys, in this election, we're going to let Mr. Taft hold the lily. What, Buck? No, I hadn't heard that. What, what he's, he, he said he didn't want to fight me, really. Well, I think that shows good sense, don't you? Yeah, in fact, I think you can attest to that from personal experience, Durango. Okay. What, Buck? No, he didn't say that, Buck. Did, did he really? That even a rat, when cornered, would fight? Oh, my word, no comment, no comment. <laughs> oh, but boys, you know, Buck, it's, well, it's a corner of his own devising. Oh, when I gave up the presidency, I left that man enough ammunition to stop the scavengers who would despoil this great west of ours ten times over. Why, I gave him four million acres of fertile farmland that federal irrigation had reclaimed from the desert and the land speculators. And I left him 150 million new national forest acres. And I left him 51 new wildlife preserves. Five, five new national parks. And most importantly, I left him a department of forestry at the cabinet level for the first time to make sure that those promises were kept. But boys, Mr. Taft has reneged and welched on every one of those promises. Oh, yes, he prefers to ride with the, the real estate manipulators and the lumber combines and the railroads. So, boys, in the name of our children and our children's children, Mr. Taft must be pulled from the saddle. But boys, because this conservation thing is not just a question of morality. Oh, no, no, no. It is a question of national survival. If we do not conserve our oil and our gas, and our timber and our water, this nation cannot long survive. And control of those things, my friends, 
must be left in the hands of the people, so Mr. Taft must go. And so evidently must I. Boys, goodbye. So good to see you. Watch your horses. Keep them away from the train. Give my love at home. I'll see you in the White House. Oh, look who arrived at the party lane. Hello, Bill Alaya. Sober. Good. Stay that way, lad. We need good men like you. from a golden city, San Francisco. I salute you, and I must thank you. Oh, yes, because after 3,000 miles of railway travel across this country, I must confess I was beginning to feel a little tattered and torn. But the warmth of this reception, well, it's rejuvenated my spirit and it's pumped new life back into my veins. I thank what, sir? Why didn't I come through what? Did you? Teddy's Ditch. <laughs> no, sir. No, I did not come through Teddy's Ditch. No, there aren't many voters in Panama. <laughs> ah, no, but I had to come across the country. I, I wanted to look into as many faces of Americans as I could to see what the last four years has done to our national self-esteem. You know, my friends, for the last four years, we have been led down the garden path. And now, in this election year, it is time to return to the path of righteousness and national self-respect. My friends, we must have it. If we do not, we cannot then respect others. And that is exactly what I sent the great white fleet around the world five years ago. You saw them here in San Francisco Bay, 19 mighty battleships of the United States of America, it was to show this country that we were a great people and we spanned a mighty continent and we belonged in two oceans and of course it was to show the world that the United States was ready to take its place as a member of the family of nations as an equal, no more, but no less. But my friends, it is not enough that we alone survive, oh no, if we are to remain true to our principles we must serve the interests of all mankind my friends we cannot we cannot sit huddled within our own borders a, an assemblage of well-to-do hucksters who care nothing for the rest of the world the question is not will we play a part in the world's affairs play it we will the question is will we play it badly or will we grasp the nettle of honorable leadership, family, and continue to be a beacon of hope for all mankind? I see the answer written in every one of your faces. It is, with proper leadership, a resounding yes. Committee fine, that's exactly where he belongs. Who am I? Colonel Roosevelt. Who are you? Freddy, Freddy who? Oh, yes, I remember your son. All right, I remember you. I'm sorry I shouted at you, Freddy. Now, what do you mean, what's going on, Freddy? You're down on the floor of the convention. I just arrived in Chicago and I'm in a hotel room. Wait a minute, I'll tell you exactly what's going on, son. It's an old fashioned attempted political rape. And I'm not going to get away with it, boy. Yes, just a hello, Bill White. How are you, Bill? What? 
Yes, you've got the list of the credentials committee. Good, put them down on the table. What? Oh, really? Son, who's there with you? Put him on. The senator's there, Bill, I'll tell him. Hello, Senator. Yes, I just got in. Now, Senator, Bill White just walked in, and he tells me that some of our people are threatening to walk off the floor of the convention because of this credentials committee mess. All right, yes, I know that's where Bill Loeb is, and that's where he belongs. All right, now listen, Senator, listen to me. I want you to get out on the floor of the convention immediately, and I want you to tell every Roosevelt delegate to not budge an inch. Do you understand me? And then I want you to quote me. I want you to tell them that we are going to beat the machine. That's right, Senator, and we're going to beat them on their own ground. All right, oh, and Senator, Senator, tell Bob LaFollette that now is the time to declare for me. Well, he was just a stalking horse anyway. All right, fine, thank you, Senator. All right, Bill White, now let's look at that list of the credentials committee and see what our weak spots are. All right, I want you to get over there immediately and buttonhole Ben Jackson, Paul Pearson, Francis Benson. Wait a minute, Bill, I don't care if they're Taft's corset laces. They're friends of mine, and they used to have some honor. Now get out of here and report back to me. Roosevelt? Yes, Bill Loeb, how are you, Bill? Yeah, what do they say? Credential say, says there are 252 contested delegate seats? That can't be! Well, wait, 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 wait a minute, Bill. Wait a minute, son. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. That means exactly what it says, contested. And we're going to win every one of those contests, Bill Loeb. Oh, yes, we are, Bill. We won every one of those seats fairly and squarely in the primaries. There's not a power on earth that can take them away from us. All right, son, get back over to the committee and then report to me immediately. Yes, who? Oh, put him on, put him on. Hello, Pincho, how are you, Gifford? Yes, just got in. What do you mean, La Follette refuses to declare for me? Ah, well, the screws are tightening, eh? Yes, of course, the machine rolleth on. Wait a minute, uh, Pincho, don't say that. There's no slippage. Uh, California, Gifford, we have all of California. Ryan, okay, wait a minute, Gifford, you get over to that California delegation and you tell Ryan, that miserable little worm, that his sacred honor is at stake in this thing, not to mention his future in Republican politics. Yes, and if that doesn't work, you tell him I'll come down there and shoot him. <laughs> Ted, how are you, son? Good to see you, Ted. What is it, son? What's the... The South has gone solidly for Taft. Gutless, 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 gutless. Roosevelt, yes, Loeb, all right, wait, 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 Bill, Bill, catch your breath, I can't understand a word, just, uh, yes, yes, you told me, 200 and, yes, 252 contested delegate. Credentials gave 238 to Taft. No, I'm right here, Bill, I'm right here. No, son, you. You stay at your post. <coughs> yes, just, just to wait further orders. Well, Ted, in the 13 primaries held, we won 272 delegate seats to Mr. Taft's 46. And this convention right now is in the process of stealing everyone. This convention no longer represents the Republican Party. Yes, Gifford, come in, Pincho, come in. What, Gifford? They want a compromise, do they? Well, Gifford, there will be no compromise with thieves. No! Compromise. In another part of this city tonight, at this very moment, in another part of Chicago, in another hall, 
the so-called Republican Party is at this very moment ruthlessly betraying the trust of the rank and the file of that party, the people, compelling us to start a new party, to forge a new instrument of government that will be responsive to the will of the people. Let history record that at this late hour on June 22nd, 1912, a phoenix has arisen from the ashes. The progressive party of America. I proudly accept your nomination, but first you must hear my confession of faith. I am to be used as in doubtful battle. Any man is to be used to his hurt or not and then cast aside and left to die. I do not want your sympathy. When you are through with me, my friends, for we battle in an honorable fashion for all mankind unheeding of the future and our individual fates with undimmed hearts and undimmed eyes, we stand at Armageddon and we Get off. Get off that man. Get off him. Don't kill him. Get off him. Get off him now. Get off him. Don't hurt him. All right now. Don't hurt him. And bring him here to me. Bring him here. Bring him. Oh. The poor creature. Take him away, but no, I'm not going to any hospital. I have a speech to deliver, and I intend to deliver it. Don't hurt him! Don't hurt him! I'm going on to the hall. My friends, I'm not sure that you're fully aware of what has transpired in another part of Milwaukee this evening, but on my way here, I sustain a gunshot wound. However, however, it takes more than that <laughs> to kill a bull moose. I, I have a speech to deliver, and I intend to deliver it while there is life left in my body. 
Now, I don't want your sympathy. I, I have had a better life than any man on this earth, that I promise you, and I don't want your sympathy. I want you to vote the progressive party ticket. And my friends, don't worry, because when the soldier who carries the flag falls, there is always, always another to take it from his hands, always. For the army is true if the cause be true. I survived the bullet, but I lost the war. The Democrats won the election with a college professor named Woodrow Wilson. I beat Mr. Taft, but it, it was a Pyrrhic victory. The country was in neither an heroic nor a principled mood, and I really think the people were a little tired of me. A feeling with which I heartily concurred. <laughs> but I ran away again. Oh yes, this time I ran away to the jungles of the Amazon, where at the request of the Brazilian government, I and my son Kermit charted 1,000 miles of unknown Amazonian river for the Brazilians and to show their appreciation they gave the the cartographers a, a name for the river to fill in the blank space on the map they called it Rio Teodoro but I overmatched myself I almost didn't make it I crushed my left leg in the rapids and then I was felled for the fourth time by malaria but blessed Kermit took command of the expedition and pulled us all through. I, I suppose it was a foolhardy thing to undertake at my age, but, well, I had to go. It, it was my last chance to be a boy. Yesterday, Edie and I took a glorious four-hour horseback ride along the ridge overlooking Oyster Bay. Trees were bare, very cold, but lovely. And then last night, she and I sat here in the north room before a blazing log fire. And we watched a snowstorm turn into a blizzard. I, I really felt as though I were hibernating, <laughs> which is normal and natural, I suppose. Oh, and marvelous news from Groton on Quentin's grades. Oh, to think of one of our family standing so high. <laughs> it's almost paralyzing. And all the children seem to be doing very well in their separate spheres, all productive, behaving themselves, as am I. Oh, yes, I'm enjoying myself mightily. Now, of course, I can embrace passions long deferred that had to be deferred because of other duties. Uh, wildlife preserves. Oh, we need so many more of them. And to get back into that fight and also to fight the so-called natural scientists again, called the nature fakers. Do you know? Well, they are the so-called natural scientists who attribute human traits to wild animals. It's a great disservice to both species. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's a terrible thing when a youngster is taught that a chipmunk thinks like his sister. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the Boy Scout movement. I was instrumental in getting that started a while back. I want to get back into that. It's a marvelous movement, really, you know. It teaches youngsters self-reliance and love of life in the rough. Now the word rough, the word rough, there is another one of my passions, simplification of the English language. Do you realize how many man hours and dollars are wasted every year because of the complexity of our language? When I was president, I tried to get 300 words simplified in the English language, tried to get it through the Congress, but it raised such a cackle that I withdrew the egg. Well, perhaps I can get it hatched now. And then, of course, there's my writing and my books and, well, I just, I just have so, so very much to do. So very, very much to do. Oh, Edie, what, yeah? 
No, 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 darling. You didn't interrupt anything at all. No, no, my dear. I was just trying to get a battle plan here, and I, I, no, dear, no, dinner. Anytime you say, dear. And no, I will not read to you after dinner, Edith. No, I will not, my dear. I will read to you right now. Oh, yes, I, Edie, I, please sit down right here, darling. That's, uh, thank you, Edith. Now, I'm going to read to you right now, my dear. No, there's nothing here that can't wait. Now, how about some Owen Wister? Oh, you brought something. Irwin? Irwin who? W Wallace Irwin. Oh, of course. Oh, Edith, you can't be serious. Well, that's the man that wrote that ridiculous doggerel about me and my uh, peacemaking attempts between the Japanese and the Russians. But you don't want me to read that you do. Edith, why? Well, all right, my dear. No, no, you don't have to have an adequate reason. Not at all. No, it's trash. That's all it is, my dear. Well, I'll read it to you. No, Edith, I'm reading to you. If you want it, you shall have it, my dear. You're sure, though? All right. You may not remember it accurately. All right. Here it is. Tis morning. And King Theodore, upon his throne sits he, and blithely as a king can sit within a free country. And now he thinks of submarines, and now of peace and war. His royal robe he handeth lobe, then wireth to the Tsar. Come off, come off, thou great white Tsar. Come off thy horse so high. Send envoys straight and arbitrate the diplomatic pie. Then straightway to the Mikadu, this letter he doth limb. Come off thy perch, thou morning sun, and do the same as him. Edith, you don't want me to read this, do you? <laughs> well, my dear, it was a rather serious business. You know, we did stop the killing and the war. Well, I know it was humorous, Edith, some of it, but all life is faintly comic. Wait a minute, though, wait a minute. Darling, wait a minute. I'm sorry. You know, you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but you know, Edith, what I think made it so immensely funny was the fact that the Russians were so very tall and the Japanese were so very small. <laughs> you know, and I was in the middle in more ways than one. <laughs> oh, yes, my dear, I remember the banquet on the presidential. Why, darling, how could I ever forget it? Why, it was right out there in our front yard in Oyster Bay. And you know, Edie, I have always felt that that banquet out there on the presidential yacht did more to seal the peace than any other single thing. Oh, yes, I did. Do you remember the problems we had with seating? Oh, dear. <laughs> Edie, I don't think you've ever been that angry with me in your life. I remember you said, Theodore, I will not permit it. I will not permit it. You said, I will be a disgrace as an international hostess if I do. And that, of course, was before you knew my problems. Will you ever forget Sergei? Six foot eight if he was an inch. And Mother Russia was in his voice when he said, Mr. President, of course the Russians must be seated before the Japanese. And then, dear Baron Kamura, dear sweet Jotaro, Mr. President, of course the Japanese must be seated before the Russians. And of course, they both had to be seated in the place of honor on my right in one chair. <laughs> I shall never forget the looks on their faces as long as I live when I ushered them into the dining salon. No chairs. <laughs> oh, yes, gentlemen, it's an old American custom. We call it buffet. That's right, gentlemen. You eat standing up. It's good for your digestion. <laughs> yes, and it turned out to be good for the world's digestion, too. You know, I think they finally got the point. Great nations playing diplomatic games with people's lives. And then, of course, at the end, when I finally got them to shake hands, Jotaro's delicate little hand and Sergei's enormous paw joined. Nothing, nothing. Not the treaty signing ceremonies at Portsmouth or my Nobel Peace Prize ever touched that one moment for me of human civility and reason. By Godfrey, it was bully. 
What, Edie? What? Oh, no, no, darling. No, no, I'm not, no, I'm not going to read any more of Mr. Irwin. Now, Edie, I... No, all right, the final stanza, you promise. All right, the final stanza, and then we're quit. Very well. All right, my dear. Final stanza, here we are. And now when ancient grandsires sit within the evening's gray, and oysters frolic noisily all over Oyster Bay, and Greybeard tells his little niece how Theodore did trek to drag the gentle bird of peace to Portsmouth by the neck. <laughs> well, you know, that is rather clever. <laughs> yes, and so are you, my dear. Oh, Edie, I know what you're up to, my darling. You're trying to show the old man that his life hasn't been a total waste. And I thank you, I thank you, Edie. And you're right, my dear, you're right. Age 56 is a time for settling in and remembering, I suppose. Thank you, dear. Now may I read you some decent prose by Mr. Owen Wister. Henry James, Edie, you wouldn't do that to me. You would. Compromise. Shakespeare? Good. All right, Macbeth? Too bloody. All right. No, no, not Hamlet, Edie. No, no, it's all right. No, darling. No, 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 it's all right. I'll read Hamlet. It's no, it's my fault, Edie, my fault. No, 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 I, I just never could understand that young man's vacillation. No, darling. No, Edie, that isn't thunder. No, that's cannon fire. And it's coming closer. It's happening. Sarah Havel! It's happening. What I told them was going to happen. The Kaiser is marching. And what is President Wilson saying? Oh, Lord, how I'd like to be president now. Why doesn't he speak? He must speak. He must speak. The Lusitania has been sunk. And men, women, and children have been murdered on the high seas. It is an act of war, and he must say so. Why doesn't he sp He's speaking. A nation can be too proud to fight. The man is incredible. Did you hear him, Kermit? Did you hear that? The man is incredible. Him and that secretary of state of his. William Jennings Bryan, the professional yodeler, the human trombone. <laughs> Prize jacks, both of them. Peace at any price, universal arbitrationist. No, Quentin, Quentin, you cannot arbitrate with bullies, my son. No, no, Quentin. You have to stand and fight, and the sooner the better. No, no, Archie, wait a minute, Archie, when Germany finishes with England. Our turn comes next. Yes, Ted, I know very well what Mr. Wilson says about neutrality, but my son, neutrality without morality is no more admirable than the neutrality of Pontius Pilate. Well put, Quinty, well put, son. Did you hear that, boys? Well put, you're right, Quinty. You cannot wash out the truth. It is indelible. It is the eternal damned spot. And the only way to eliminate it is for the American people to face it fairly and squarely. Oh, I know, boys. God knows. I've tried, Archie. I've tried 26 cities in two years. But now I'm afraid your father must seem like a rather bloodthirsty warrior. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Trying to cruelly thwart the humane plan of the noble Mr. Wilson. Oh, wait a minute, Ted. Of course he has a plan. His plan is to bring universal peace by writing exquisitely phrased letters. I wonder how many admonitory notes he sent to the Kaiser thus far. I lost track after 850, Series B. <laughs> My sons, Mr. Woodrow Wilson is a classic and glowing example of everything I do not want you to become. He is sly and crafty without a touch of heroism or a spark of loftiness in his cold, mean, timid soul. And he dwells now in the summer White House called Shadow Lawn. Well, there should be shadows enough at Shadow Lawn. The shadows of men, women, and children who have risen from the ooze of the ocean bottom. Innocent men, women, and children that Mr. Wilson dared not protect for fear he would place himself in danger. Those are the shadows appropriate for Shadow Lawn. He's speaking. Yes. 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 
That's what I've been shouting all along. But the prophet doesn't give a hang because we're finally in it. Two years late, but we're finally in the war. And it's bully! Mr. President, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, at your disposal, sir. Yes, Mr. President. It's good to see you too, sir. Thank you. Mr. President, as you may have read or heard, a rather extraordinary number of men have rallied behind me, and I stand ready, sir, at your direction, of course, to lead a volunteer regiment into France just as soon as po You hadn't heard. Well, these have been busy times for all of us, Mr. Wilson. Now, I have here... My wife is fine, sir. And yours. Good. Now, I have... My children are all well. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, in fact, three of my sons are already in the fight, and Quentin will be in shortly. Now, I have... Well, yes, of course, sir, I am indeed very proud that I have four such sons. Mr. President, I have here the T.O. for the regiment. The table of organization, sir. Yes, if you would just peruse it, you will see that all necessary expenses will be derived from private funds. Staff officers approved, quartermaster approved, weaponry by me, of course. Yes, and Newton Baker, the Secretary of War, he's an old friend of mine. Mr. President, Newton Baker has done some wonderful work for me in the past. Sir, if you would just sign right... Well, I may have moved a bit hastily, but I felt it was important that we move with dispatch if we are to show our allies and the Germans that although we were woefully unprepared, we are indeed coming over. Sir, just give me your hand on it. I'll tell the press. I've got them waiting outside. What? Oh. Oh, oh excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Well, I see. Wait a minute. I may have moved hastily, but I certainly had no ulterior motive. I see. Wilson, I firmly believe when I came here today that the sight of an ex-president of the United States leading our first troops into combat would electrify the world and scare the hell out of the Hun. I see. Mr. President, please, sir, you must allow me to die in some reasonably honorable fashion at the head of my troops in France. Yes, Edie, Edie, he saw me, dear, he saw me. Yes, 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 he gave me time. He turned me down. What? Oh, the coat. Oh, yes, of course, the coat. My Edie, Edie, is my, is my cross still there? My Siegfried cross. Good. <laughs> good, 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 good. Well, I'm out of it. Out of it, out. What then? No, no, I'll see you at dinner. I'll see you at dinner. No, darling, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to write a note to come in. I'll, I'll see you at dinner. Dear, come it. Quentin is in. Huzzah. Off to join the new Air Force in France. Mother said it was hard when the youngest went, but you can't bring up boys to be eagles and expect them to turn out sparrows. Yesterday, we received word that Archie had been given the Quad de Guerre. And then yesterday, we received a cable from Ted saying that Archie had been wounded shrapnel in the leg. Yesterday at luncheon, 
we all filled our glasses with Madeira and drank them off to Archie. Mother, eyes shining, cheeks flushed, as pretty as a picture, as beautiful as any heroine in romance, suddenly dashed her glass to the floor, saying, that glass shall never be drunk from again. Here, the woods are showing green foam. The gay yellow of the Forsythia has appeared. I rejoice that my four sons are playing parts in the greatest of the world's greatest days. What man of gallant spirit doesn't envy you? As for me, I cease to fret at my impotence to do anything in this great crisis. I putter around like the other old frumps, trying to help with liberty loans and Red Cross and the like. But you, my four sons, are having your crowded hour and I am beside you all in spirit. Lovingly, <laughs> the old frump. Well, what do you think? Bishop Teddy to old Frump. That must please you mightily, doesn't it? What's the matter? You're so overcome with emotion, you can't speak. I want to read you a wire that just, just arrived today. He's gone. Walked out on me. July 5th, 1918, Headquarters American Expeditionary Force, Dover. Today, Lieutenant Quentin Roosevelt, United States Air Corps, brought down his first German airplane over France. Needless to say, Mrs. Roosevelt and I are as proud as peacocks. You know, it was just 20 years ago, 20 years, four days ago, to be exact, July 1st, 1898, on the island of Cuba in the Spanish-American War, that my crowded hour began. I had my troops Deployed in the jungle at the foot of the hill, we'd been receiving intense machine gun and rifle fire from the Spaniards in the blockhouse at the top. And we had the San Juan River on our left, and we had a sunken road on our right, and the men were lying prone or crouched behind cover, awaiting my order. I had planned to go on foot, but mounted. I could see the men better. And they could see me. Dudley Dean, quarterback, Harvin, Smokey Moore, cowpuncher, Bob Wren, footballer, Yale, Garrison Gerard, Yale, footballers, Bucky O'Neill, gunfighter, mayor of Prescott, Arizona, Colbert, full blooded Pawnee. Jackson, Chickasaw, Princeton men, Channing and Devereaux, footballers, Waller, high jumper, national tennis champion, 
Little McGinty. Prank buster. College men, non-college men, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and some later would be buried in a common grave as Americans. And then, in that moment, just before the advance, as it always seems to happen, everything on earth seems to stop. You can't think, you can't breathe. And the only action in the world is the overwhelming pounding of your own heart. All right, boys. Boys, move up to the edge of the clearing. Keep your interval. Move up to the edge of the clearing and await my order. Now pass the word. And as the word went down the line, each man looked to the right and then to the left to see who would go first. But then slowly, slowly, they move. All right, son. Son, move up to the edge of the clearing and await my order. Son, did you hear me? Move up to the edge of the clearing and await my order. Now move. What's the matter, son? Are you frightened? Son! He was dead. A bullet had passed lengthwise through his body. I on horseback had been spared. He, behind cover, had been killed. Slowly, slowly we made our way to the edge of the clearing and we took cover behind an old stone wall. The fire had been intense from the blockhouse at the top, but now it increased in volume. And beyond the stone wall lay a treeless slope. The blockhouse and the top a million miles away. down over France. Oh, my God. No, 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 twenty three, please. Oh, my God. To never be able to touch him again. Oh, there were so many things that, that we never had a chance to talk about. Oh, my God. This is Colonel Roosevelt. The press, a statement. Here's just, just say that Mrs. Roosevelt and I are very grateful that he had a chance to serve his country.
Only those are fit to live, who do not fear to die, and none is fit to die, who has shrunk from the joy of life and the duty of life, for both life and death are both parts of the same great adventure. And, and it's, it's bully. Just bully!